You're listening to Marks of a Healthy Church, a Sunday school series taught by the elders and deacons of Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Our topic today is going to be uh, elders of the church. Um, Between church discipline and discipleship, it's lasted for about the last... 17 years. I think there's been children that have been raised on, in this church in the amount of time that it's taken to go through dis, uh, discipline and, uh, and sorry discipleship. Um, so actually, uh, I was uh, saying with Travis last week, uh, Travis wanted me to come up here and read the passage from 1 Timothy 3 and then just walk away. Um, that's what Travis would have done, um, but I'm not going to do that. Actually, then Travis wanted me to come up and uh, there's an audiobook version of this and he, he wanted me to come up and just click play on the audiobook and then walk away. So, but we're not going to do that. It's, it's not up to Travis. Maybe. We should, we should ask him. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's not here. That's convenient. Mm-hmm. So it's been said, if leadership is word-centered, the church will be word-centered. If leadership is mission-minded, the church will be mission-minded. If leadership is sincere, then the people will be sincere. If the leadership is kind, the church will be kind. But this is also true in a negative way. Unloving, narrow, stingy leaders beget an unloving, narrow, and stingy church. Leadership sets the tone for how the church functions, how the church is perceived, and most importantly, how the church represents Jesus Christ. Through His Word, God has ordained certain offices to allow His church to carry out its mission. This morning, we're going to look at the office of an elder. Now, I believe it's safe to say that many churchgoers are often actually somewhat confused about what the role of an elder is. To be fair, I think many churchgoers are often confused about church polity in general or how the church is structured. Unfortunately... That confusion, I don't think, stops there because I think that a lot of times elders are actually confused about what the job of an elder is. And I think you can even go one step further, although an elder is the same as a pastor, and say that sometimes a head pastor in certain situations are actually somewhat confused as to what their role is too. Now, for the record, I don't think that's the case here by any means. Um, I need to clear the air on that one. But it's important. Clarity is important. Now, where do you think all this confusion comes from? Well, I think at least in some part, it's a lack of attention to what the Word says. And it's a simple reading of God's Word. Read it plainly. And then don't add on everything else that you think is a good idea. Just read God's Word and use those qualifications. It must be concluded here from the beginning of this uh, session on elders that God's Word is sufficient for this. It's what we need. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. God's Word is sufficient. When we look at how we are to structure the church, how the offices of the church are to fulfill themselves, we look to God's Word. A consequence of this confusion is that oftentimes elders end up importing their leadership ideas from their own experiences or their careers. They think eldering is something along the lines of administering a school, running a company, maybe commanding a warship, managing a project, directing operations, overseeing subcontractors, or serving on a board of trustees. While these life experiences most likely do prove useful, overseeing a church is a unique task. Again, the word must be the focus. Now, a point of clarification here that I think is important to make, and it, it depends what translation of the Bible you use, but I think it's important to note that um, when you see the word bishop or overseer or elder or pastor, those words are actually used interchangeably. So it's not that one means something entirely different, although if you go all the way back to the Greek, there might be slight differences, but as it's used in the, in the New Testament, the word of bishop, overseer, elder, and actually pastor um, all mean somebody who's in a position in the church of leadership and specifically there to preach the word. Um, I must admit that there are far more texts that deal with the role of an elder than I had previously thought before I began my study. 
Um, there are more than a dozen texts in the New Testament that speak to elders. In fact, almost every New Testament author addresses elders in some capacity. The biblical job description is slightly different than many people, I think, would expect, right? Again, I think we look and we're a part of uh, the world and we look at how things in the world operate and then we come to church and we just kind of seem to think that how leadership structures work elsewhere, we think that that's somehow going to be how, how the leadership structure of the church operates as well. But again, we need to clarify that the Word needs to be the foundation. So let's go to the Word. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to read through um, verses 1 to 7. 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, This is a true saying. If a man desired the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, uh, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, nor greedy, of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children sub. Uh, in subjection with all gravity. For if a man not know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 7 is a text that describes the qualifications or describes the description of what an elder does. The sentiment of, I am qualified to be an elder because I love Jesus and have a seminary degree, or I am qualified to be an elder because I can preach decently, or I am qualified to be an elder because I am in some position in management at my place of work, those are all common ideas as to what the qualifications of an elder are, But when you read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, and you start to see biblically what the qualifications are, those sentiments that we just read compared to what the Bible says, all of a sudden they don't necessarily line up. Again, the word is sufficient. It must be stated that the church should and must allow God's word to vet candidacy for an elder. So let's go through some of them today. And our our large part of our day today is going to be spent on uh, just going through what these qualifications of an elder are. Um, a quick note before we start is, is to note just how much of being an elder is actually about the individual's character, about the reputation. It's not, when you read through verse 1 to 7 in the third chapter of 1 Timothy, it's not all about their organizational gifts and their charismatic ability to speak. Now, certainly they need to be able to teach. That's a a qualification. But character and reputation are of utmost importance when when considering a candidate for uh, an eldership position. So number one, first first qualification. Uh, First qualification would be that uh, an individual would have a desire to be an elder. So 1 Timothy 3.1. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop. 1 Peter 5.2 says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Meaning that there actually has to be a desire within that individual, within that man, to step up into the role of an elder. The responsibility of of an elder is such that if a man holds the office but does not desire to do so, burnout, or the potential of burnout, is probably inevitable. The responsibilities that are required of an elder are going to wear and to grind onto some, on somebody who does not have a desire to be there. And the Holy Spirit must place that desire within that man. Qualification number two. An elder exemplifies godly character. New Testament writers place a great emphasis on this holy character. 1 Timothy 3, 2-3. Let's read back through it. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, and not covetous. 
Titus 1, 7, 8 says, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, and temperate. How much of that is spent describing the individual's character? Right? It's, it's really, really heavy on their reputation, on their character. Um, now, as Rena starts, states in his book, we've been going through uh, this book series. It's a fantastic book series. Um, as, and we're using these as an outline to give these um, sessions on um, what a healthy church looks like. But as, as Rena states in his book, Jesus' under shepherds must reflect the character of Jesus. Better a godly elder with mediocre leadership gifts than a charismatic leader with glaring moral flaws. The character of that individual is of the utmost importance. They must be blameless. Now, this does not mean that an elder has transcended sin. We would not actually be able to have any elders if that was the case, right? (laughs) It would be kind of a vacant uh, position. Um, Tiabiti says it well when he says, being above reproach, he gives some clarification here, he says, being above reproach means that an elder is to be the kind of man whom no one suspects of wrongdoing or immorality. People would be shocked to hear this kind of man charged with such acts. Again, it's not that they're perfect, but that they're living a life that demonstrates that they are pursuing Christ and their character and their reputation back that up. They must live and display an exemplary degree of Christ-likeness. They must be self-controlled. Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's very important. When we read through the qualifications, we hear self-control, must be temperate, sober-minded, disciplined, in control of oneself as to honor the Lord, being in control of, uh, of what you do, of how you operate. It's interesting here that Paul also warns against a particular lack of self-control a couple times. It's mentioned both in Timothy and in Titus, and that's addiction to wine, um, drunkenness. Now, the New Testament doesn't uh, prohibit the consumption of alcohol by any means, but it certainly does say that that person must have the capacity for self-denial. Right? They need to have an ability to uh, take in moderation. This kind of links back to what would, uh, what sorry Dan uh, was speaking about regarding um, fasting. Right? Just the entire uh, concept of having actually having a discipline and an ability to say no, right? And I think if we're honest with ourselves and we look at the way that our culture operates and we, we look at the way that we operate in a lot of ways, whether it be our eating habits, uh, maybe our consumption of social media, our consumption of TV, whatever it may be, ask yourself honestly, do you have a capacity for self-denial, right? Can you, do you have the capacity to tell yourself no and then the discipline to actually follow that? It's important. Yep. I guess so. There's two things that, um, number one, I think we've got to be careful in this, especially this um, this topic, because I think some of us are tempted to just to, to zone out of this, because, like, well, we're not elders, so it doesn't matter. So those qualifications, almost all of them, not all, but they're in line with believers. Believers mm-hmm. can act this way as well. Absolutely. The elders call to exemplify it. Yep. So, so don't check out of that, because... It does give us a standard to look to as yeah. believers that th- these are the things we ought to be doing as well, right? Yep. You just can't, the moderation factor, the, the blameless, and all yes. those things. And number two, I don't know that we realize in our world today, pastors now are struggling with alcoholism, mm-hmm. a real problem mm-hmm. in ministry, and addiction. Mm-hmm. And so it's really important what Paul is telling us here in the scripture For sure. because it mm-hmm. is a problem and it's destroying churches yeah. and ministries. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point about um, the, the rest of the, the body. Uh, those are qualifications for them as well. That They should be living their lives in that way, right? That's, that's right. Just made me think of, um, you know, you go throughout your week and the elder or plurality of elders, which we're going to talk about a little bit later in the series, but um, the elders are only few. The congregation or the rest of the members of the body are many. And if the members of the body are acting in the ways like we have described here this morning, honoring the Lord, uh, you can imagine the impact as they go out and rub shoulders with all of the people that they see during the week too, right? That's, that's a great point. It's very important. Elders must be gentle. Uh, they must not be arrogant or hot-tempered. Elders are not meant to be combative and aggressive. 
Elders are meant to be gentle giants. Now, gentleness does not mean in any way weakness or cowardice, but elders lead and exercise their authority with the tenderness of a shepherd and the sensitivity of a loving father. Elders are not to be greedy. 1 Peter 5.2 it says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of ready mind. Elders must not be greedy for money. Now, I think oftentimes the spotlight for this one simply falls or solely falls on the head of the paid pastor, the, the person in our, our churches as we know today that would be the head pastor. Um, but I think that that is actually somewhat... Uh, it limits your view somewhat. I would say that elders, um, lay elders who struggle in this area will often have a hard time investing time and energy in caring for the congregation, right? They're being greedy, but, but in certainly in a, in a way that maybe is a little bit different than what you would expect. Uh, both are in the wrong there. It's important to know. Um, if you have your Bibles, take your Bibles really quick and, and take a look at the passage that directly follows the one that we read this morning. So we read chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, verse 1 to 7. Verse 8 to 13 goes on to describe the qualifications for deacons. And just with the person beside you, just take a moment if you have a Bible and just take a, a, a quick glance at the qualifications of that of a deacon. And we're going to just compare and contrast very briefly what those look like here in a second. No, by all means. Fire away. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, sorry, you, just to clarify, you said that only men should preach the gospel. So I would, and I believe it's the position of this church that we would support that. Yes. Um, and scripture certainly backs that up. Um, I think there are other people that use um, some other arguments to justify straying from that. Um, but Pastor and Pastor Dan, I would you would you would certainly agree that the the Word of God suggests that that is the truth. What you what you said? Yes, absolutely. It is a contentious issue, though. So thank you for prefacing it like that. Yes. And we're gonna we are gonna get to that. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yes. Yeah. In a, a formal s- service where everybody is present. That's that's right. But you're right. In a, a women's group, that is absolutely the case. And we are we're gonna get to that here. So the passage directly following the one that we read on uh, elders. Does anybody notice, or can anybody, and maybe from previous study, you probably maybe know this already. But what would be the difference between the qualifications for a deacon? versus the qualifications for an elder. What's kind of the major uh, distinction there? Does anybody know? Dan? Uh, for the deacon, it doesn't mention anything about teaching. Okay, yeah, very good. So for the deacon, it doesn't many mention anything about teaching. If you take a look at, at those lists, they're actually strikingly similar. Um, but the, the elder is specifically tasked with teaching the Word. Um, the ability to teach. First Timothy 3, 2, a bishop must be blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. Teaching is central to the shepherd's work. Teaching the sheep, the word, is of the utmost importance. Uh, in John 10, 27, 28, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. What, what beautiful verses those are. Um, but how do the sheep know God's voice? Right? God has spoken, and he's spoken through the Bible. He's spoken through his word. And the job of an elder is to get up faithfully every week and to, to preach that word. The, elder, sorry, the sheep must hear the shepherd's voice. Now, not that the under-shepherd is the voice of God, but he's certainly speaking for God. The word is important, and it's the job of the elder to proclaim that word. Titus 1.9, holding fast to the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So what are they to teach? The elder to teach the word. They hold, uh, hold fast to the faithful word as taught. Next qualification that we're going to look at is to lead your family well. An elder's home life matters immensely. 
Marriage and Parenting Act as a Proving Ground for an Elder's Fitness. I'm not sure there's anything else uh, that would maybe cause elders to tremble than this one here. Uh, we're going to talk about it here in a minute, but I think far too often that has been an area of an elder's life that has been neglected. Um, Winston Churchill once attended a formal banquet in London where the dignitaries were asked the question, if you could not be who you are, who would you like to be? It's kind of an interesting question. Naturally, everyone was curious as to what Churchill, who was seated next to his beloved wife, Clemmy, would say. When it was finally his turn, the old man, the last respondent to the question, rose and gave his answer. If I could not be who I am, I would most like to be, and here he paused to take his wife's hand, Lady Churchill's second husband. (laughs) Churchill was a clever man, and he was a one-woman man, despite his other proclivities. An elder must be a one-woman man. 1 Timothy 3, 2 and Titus 1, 6 are, are very clear on this. That means faithful to his wife which includes not just being faithful to his wife and not straying with another woman, but it also means being free from visiting pornographic websites. Now, how many of us got probably uncomfortable when I said that word, right? That's something in the church that is just swept under the rug all the time. And yet statistics on this are absolutely rampant. Pornography is a huge, huge issue. And yet here we see in the qualifications of an elder that an elder must be, must be free from that. It's a huge problem in the church and it needs to be, I think, addressed more specifically. Um, And I think that it's something that we we shouldn't continually sweep under the rug. No one has a perfect marriage, but it should demonstrate a pattern of love. Marriage is to reflect Christ and his church. You ever think about that? Marriage is to reflect Christ and his church. Just try and consider that for a moment. It's, it's, um, it's pretty crazy. An elder must be an effective father. There are striking similarities between a, a being a dad and being uh, an elder. I'm just going to read a quote from uh, the book that I thought was uh, very uh, appropriate for, for this section. Uh, it says, Can you see similarities between being a dad and being an elder? In both cases, a man takes on a leadership role. In both, he bears the primary responsibility to help those under his care grow and live together in harmony. Both parenting and eldering are about guiding people toward maturity within a community context. Learn to shepherd God's family by shepherding yours first. It's very, very important. The first priority is should be to learn how to shepherd your own family well. If you're not doing that, you're not qualified to be an elder. Uh, Is an elder's children well-behaved or out of control? Is the elder instructing his children at home about God's word? And are the kids experiencing excessive harshness, or are they being nurtured and brought up in the ways of the Lord? Again, an elder is not perfect, right? They are a sinful human being just like the rest of us. But there should be a pattern that is lining up with what the qualifications say uh, in First Timothy. A note must be made here that the priorities of an elder are very important, and I like what um, Mark De- uh, sorry, and a note must be made here that the priorities of an elder to his family must is very important. I like what Dever said here. He says, "My congregation can get another pastor, but my children cannot get another father, or my wife another husband." And that has been uh, drast- this area has been drastically neglected by uh, elders, by pastors in, in the past. And pastor, I want to go back to making people uncomfortable in a second. Yep. Um, <laughs> you do that well, Pastor. I'll be there in a minute. Okay. But, um, <laughs> um, years ago, the the consensus for ministry back in the '70s mm-hmm. out of big schools in the states for pastors was take care of the work of God, and God will take care of your family. Mm-hmm. To the neglect of their family. Yeah. And and we reaped a whirlwind of problems mm-hmm. because because men really thought that I'm just gonna do the work of God, not knowing that the work of God included their home mm-hmm. and discipling their children. Mm-hmm. And not that our kids are perfect, because they're not. You know three of mine mm-hmm. I have. Um, not perfect. But the truth is, even in those issues, 
we're called to deal with them mm-hmm. and, and not ignore those things yep. and work our way through those things. And sometimes very difficult, but I, I think you're exactly right. We have acted like, well, the family's not, if you can't rule your home well, you cannot in yeah. church. It's impossible. Yeah. Because that's the proving ground for us. Yeah. It really is. It's so interesting to see, and, and yet so, I think, so easy to get there how, I mean, I imagine they started out with very good intent, right? Pouring yourself into ministry. But to, to miss that in the text, it, it's, it seems so glaring, but yet it's, I think it should be a warning to all of us that in what areas of our life are, are we doing that as well, right? We're, we're seemingly with good intent, but yet we're, we're not being mindful and thoughtful of exactly what Scripture is saying. Wait, Daniel, before you go. Um, and I, I'm watching you. Is this the uncomfortable part? <laughs> okay. And the other thing is this. Good, godly men and women can raise children who rebel against mm-hmm. the Lord. Right? That's not what he's talking yep. about there. He's yep. not. Because, because we all have people in our life we love and care for, and yet ultimately our kids can make those decisions. And mm-hmm. they can leave and, and turn their back on God. So that's not what he's talking about mm-hmm. there. You know, within our, in our home, we have an obligation and responsibility to try mm-hmm. to lead those children well. Mm-hmm. And that's really important. Go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, like, the historical record bears witness to this fact. Some yeah. of the most outspoken voices against Christianity have been children of ministry. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I just think of uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, I think there was a couple in his basically the class, like that, that area of class, okay. that their father yeah. pastors local churches and they just rebelled wholesale. And Derailed, yeah. And just devoted the, their life's work. That's right, the passion and the to go against it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great that's a great point. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what are your thoughts for the chapter the thoughts uh, about a, a young man graduating from seminary and then being a senior pastor where he doesn't have a family yet where he's got mm-hmm. children. Yeah, no that's so that I, that's interesting you bring that up. I was actually gonna ask uh, everybody that question. So does that uh, single single guy um According to the qualifications we read this morning, does that disqualify him from being an elder? Does anybody want to speak to that? It can't. It can't. You have Paul. Absolutely. You have Paul. I agree. Paul writing to young Timothy, not knowing his age. I agree. So I think this is a standard for us to Mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. Even in that regard, Tom, if a young pastor is going to be senior pastor, he ought to have other elders along with him. Mm -hmm. To help and to encourage him, and yep. that's the beauty mm-hmm. of doing this the right way. Yep. Because that one young man is not on his own, because that's way too much responsibility and yep. pressure. Yep. Yep. And thoughts? and still the emphasis being placed on that man in his singleness staying pure and fulfilling the other qualif- qualifications that are there. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Great. Great question. Damn. Hmm. What about divorce? Not quite. <laughs> Pastor, you want to speak to that one? <laughs> yeah, no, we're we're good. We're good. <laughs> so, yeah, are, are you if you are in a position of, as an elder yep. and you experience divorce, mm-hmm. you then no longer qualify continuing that relationship. Mm-hmm. Like, Pastor, you want to speak to that one? No. <laughs> I deflected that one nicely. <laughs> That's a good question. It, it's a question that causes great controversy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and here's the problem. We live in a simple world where a man can be doing the right thing, and yeah. his wife can just, yeah, can just mm-hmm. bow out of it, and, and he has no control of that. I personally think that divorce disqualifies you. Yeah. That's, that's what I personally think. Mm-hmm. I, I think... And, and not that does, not that it disqualifies you from Christian service at all, mm-hmm. because you can still actively and be mm-hmm. a great access a, asset to the church. But I think the idea of of that home crumbling, even if it wasn't your fault, I think it would disqualify yeah. a man to be an elder because th- there are practical ramifications to that too: mm-hmm. counseling, mm-hmm. marriages, yeah. examples. And I just think. <coughs> Yeah. Whatever, even if it's unfair for that man who maybe was not the cause of that, mm-hmm. um, I think it does. Yeah. That. Yeah. I think you're right, and I don't think blame is never 100 percent and zero, right? There's always there's always some, right? I mean, if if that man, um, I mean, even if from from an outside perspective it looked like 
his wife, in this case, just completely left him out of the blue, uh, I would want to take a look at how was that man shepherding her in the years leading up to that, right? And if, if that's going to disqualify him, then that's the... I think there's someone in our contemporary world right now that that happened to, that great speaker, great mm-hmm. preacher, but I think his wife was done because I think there was this neglect mm-hmm. in the home. So mm-hmm. he actually still has yeah. it. Yeah. But that's my personal thought. Of yeah. yeah, that's good. All right, let's keep, let's keep going. We have another question. Yeah. Um, I was, when we were talking about elders and raising your kids, and, um, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a scary thing raising your kids and, and these qualifications as an elder. Um, I think that when we were young, we were really focused on our kids. Okay, let's get them to obey and mm-hmm. out, almost the outward because we're so afraid that if they blew it, then we did the job. Let's yeah. Take me out of the yeah. But coming here, I have to say, um, it's a family, and people help us with our kids. Mm-hmm. And in all all the phases of our kids, you know, whether they were being mad in the nursery and they had to come get us, yeah. um, David, every week, 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 of all my kids' life, and that is, for an elder, it is so, it's just such a help, it is, and mm-hmm. I think mean, this is a good place where we have so much time to raise more part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I'll just add that, seeing that for what it is, too, our boys, I think this was Greg and AJ, shot trees down in the back when we first got here. What's doing with it? <laughs> AJ's not here, so Greg's here with AJ. <laughs> But Bob and Shirley Wood, who were managing the grounds, came and paid us a visit and said, Hey, this is, you know, someone's back there shutting down oh, live trees. So, before the ash Yeah, okay. Yeah, it wasn't helpful. Yeah. Um, so, we found out, I guess, it wasn't Greg, it was AJ. And so, Bob Wood <laughs> took AJ back in the woods and he. <laughs> we got a chainsaw they cut them all up they stacked them they did the work they cleaned up yep. and it was good yep. and that was part of the church yep. helping us with our children For sure. and it was a beautiful thing not to be offended by that see mm-hmm. because when someone comes to you about your kids the first response is well not my kids ours is yep. yeah of course our kids yep. but we know our kids yeah. but, but, but not Greg um, but the defensiveness is not good. Yes. And it was it was refreshing to see the church allow us to raise three boys yep. that they knew weren't perfect. Mm-hmm. And the pressure's off then to, to produce this impossibility yeah. of these robots that are For sure. just right. It's just, yep. it's not the case. So, yep. amen to that. Yeah. It's a good place. That's a good thought. Yep. All right, let's keep, let's keep going here. So an elder uh, must be, we'll continue along, hospitable. Paul twice commands elders to be hospitable. 1 Timothy 3.2 and Titus 1.8. Elders are not to be hospitable simply when an opportunity seems to like fall into their lap, uh, but they are to actually pursue opportunities to be hospitable. Hospitality can reveal kindness, compassion, and care for the needy and lost. Hospitality others, allows others, I should say, to see your life in action. Uh, if your house... I love this quote from the book. It says, if your house were a church, uh, would the people that are visiting want to come back for another visit? It's a really interesting thought. If your house were a church, would they want to come back for another visit? Are you being hospitable? Number five, the fifth qualification. Elder, uh, an elder is, and we were speaking about this just earlier, a male role. Now, I'm not sure there's anything that's more controversial uh, considering uh, our popular culture today uh, and how much uh, feminism and everything like that is being pushed. I'm not sure if there's anything much more controversial uh, than that uh, when you when you contrast what the, the world believes and what the church believes according to the Word of God. God has called men to lead. It's important to note, Paul said twice in different concept, contexts, that an overseer must be a one-woman man. That, that is, is fairly clear as far as qualifications go. Now, and Carolyn spoke to this, does this mean that there are not roles, uh, even teaching roles within the church that can be filled by women? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, as Carolyn pointed out, uh, in the context of a ladies' meeting or a, some sort of ladies' get-together, um, that is absolutely a teaching role that, that 
is and should be fulfilled by uh, a, a female. In fact, there are many ways in which women can serve and fulfill roles within the church um, in, in various ways. Uh, however, eldership, specifically when you're talking about eldership, the opening and preaching teaching of the word in a formal uh, setting with the entire church body, um, is reserved for a male. Eldership is more than a gifting or a ministry. It is a specific office that God has ordained. Elder describes a specific office, a divinely appointed role, a distinct position within an organizational structure of a local church. Just as the father is a distinct, divinely appointed position in the family. As with the role of a father, so God has sovereignly summoned qualified men to the role of elder. Again, controversial topic in our world today. Um, I think that we need to uh, certainly do our best in in whatever topic we're talking about is to, to shut the noise that the world produces out, to do our best to leave those presuppositions at the door, and just to approach God's word humbly and to see what it says. And as we go through the qualifications for an elder, it is clear that uh, the role specifically of an elder is reserved for for a male. Uh, an established believer. We'll get one more done here real quick and then we'll, we'll be done. Uh, an established believer. An elder must be an established believer. Um, let's actually back that way up because this is necessary. Uh, first, an elder has to actually be a believer. I know that kind of sounds crazy in the context of what we're talking about. But think of the drastic consequences... And this does play out today. Think of the drastic consequences of an unsaved man getting put into the role of an elder. And it does happen, right? Genuinely, is that individual that you are thinking about adding to as uh, an elder to your church, are they, uh, are they saved? Are they part of the king, kingdom of God? Paul warned against new Christians stepping into the role of an elder. We see that in 1 Timothy 3.6. New Christians can amaze by their zeal for spiritual things, their rapid transformation, and their fearless evangelism. But the term elder implies wisdom, and most importantly, experience, things that a new believer lacks. A new convert should focus their time and energy in growing in their walk with Christ. Um, I love what J.I. Packer says about uh, books, actually. He says that you should read two old books for every one new one. And it's because, not that the new ones aren't, good, it's because the old ones have stood the test of time. There's a beauty and there's a truth about books that have stood the test of time and have remained truthful and remained uh, in in the right for for that amount of time, right? The the same can be said about uh, a a new elder. Uh, They they may be somebody that's very much qualified and somebody that's going to go on to uh, do great things for the kingdom of God, but as a new convert, they need time to be tested first. We're not going to get to the last part that we have for today. We'll pick that up next week. We're actually going to look at, uh, to start next week, um, just the example of Jesus Christ. As you go through the Gospels, uh, I've actually had a, a really cool opportunity uh, in the new year, uh, November, December, and then into the new year, um, teaching at Chatham Christian School. We've been going through a couple of the different Gospels uh, with some of my Bible classes. And then uh, we have a little group that gets together together um, on Thursday mornings, we've been going through another one. So I've been going through actually three Gospels kind of at the same time, and it's really, really neat to see the different accounts and how they line up and the little nuances and the little, the little uh, slight variances, which we can talk more about next week. Um, but as you go through the Gospels and you see the life of Jesus, you start to see that Jesus is the perfect elder. It's really amazing how Jesus lives his life uh, the situations he gets himself into. And then if you start to contrast that with our qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3, 1-7, to uh, it's a beautiful thing to actually look at the life of Christ and to see how well he fulfills uh, those qualifications. So we'll end there for this morning.